When I was a child growing up in The Message, our family listened to cassette tapes of The Prophet. We were very devout and listened to them often. We listened to them in our home, in our car, on the road. I even listened to them myself on my Sony Walkman at school, on my walk home, and sometimes at night as I went to sleep. Sometimes I listened to them when I awakened while the family was still asleep, and if I had trouble sleeping, I put on my headset and listened to them on my pillow. I still remember waking up from that uncomfortable feeling that the Walkman headset gave my ear after sleeping for hours on my side. I had my own collection of favorite tapes and I listened to them as often as I could. Some of them I played so many times that the magnetic tape was wearing thin and the voice did not sound quite right. One of my favorite stories that the prophet told about his childhood was his trip out west and seeing the Kansas Outlaw. The Kansas Outlaw must have been the wildest horse in all the west. The prophet told how he wanted to become a rodeo rider, but after watching another rider badly injured, he decided he wasn't a rider. When that horse shot out of the chute with a rider holding on for dear life, it only took one single buck from that horse to throw the rider into the air and to send him into an ambulance. A man came to offer $500 to anyone who could ride him and asked the prophet if he was a rider. And the prophet quickly said, no, he wasn't a rider. I used to listen to that story and wonder what made him decide to leave his log cabin in Kentucky. Before I knew that the prophet was raised in the booming city of Jeffersonville, I had mental images of the prophet running through fields and trees deep in the hills of Kentucky. Burksville, where his Kentucky log cabin was located, sat along the Cumberland River. I often thought about what life would have been like along that river, free as a bird and without a worry or care in the world while mistakenly thinking that Jeffersonville was an old-fashioned one-horse town, I thought it would have made Jeffersonville, Indiana feel just like home. What made the prophet decide to leave his family behind, I thought. When I thought about the prophet's adventures out west, I never really thought about the situation that he left behind. I never thought about how difficult it must have been for them without Charles, their father still thinking that Charles had died while the prophet was in grade school. The prophet said that he hunted and fished to feed his family, but he never really said who provided for them when he left Jeffersonville. It made me curious to learn more about his family when he left them. I reread the article describing Charles Branham's arrest and the desperate situation for the Branham family. I thought about the government raiding the property with the prophet working all day to bring water for producing whiskey and tried to imagine how the prophet would have responded when the authorities arrived. Newspapers said that the prophet was shot while hunting. Was he? I remembered the prophet describing that hunting injury. According to the life stories, the prophet described another boy accidentally shooting a shotgun at him and the shot went through both legs at a close range but he also said that it was a minister. I remember the prophet saying that the Ku Klux Klan paid his hospital bill. This always struck me as a little odd because he spoke favorably of the Klan, quote unquote, no matter what they did. When I thought about the Ku Klux Klan, I never had favorable thoughts. The Ku Klux Klan was a terroristic organization and they were responsible for the torture and the death of innocent men, women, and children. When I thought about the Klan, I thought about secret meetings with burning crosses. I thought about violence, bigotry, and hatred. I thought about the fear that they caused for mothers and children. I never once thought of them with any favorable emotion. Why would the prophet be praising the Ku Klux Klan? In the 1920s Jeffersonville, however, the Ku Klux Klan would have seemed like heroes. They allegedly helped take down the Wathen Liquor Ring, 
They boasted that they had secured all the evidence for officials to arrest those producing liquor, which would have included Wathen's operation and Charles Branham. All of this painted a very different image in my mind about the time of the prophet's life. Young William feeding the whiskey still with water during the day, Charles working with Wathen and the mob during the night, the Ku Klux Klan secretly spying on the Branham family, Charles being arrested, Wathen posting his bail and fighting for his release. It was almost overwhelming. After Charles Branham's arrest, the Ku Klux Klan published details in the Fiery Cross and began a campaign to expose all of those involved in illegal activities. Still, it was the newspaper articles age 16 for the prophet that made me most curious. According to the life stories, the prophet bought a brand new car at age 16. He took his first trip out west at age 16. How could he afford to buy a brand new car when the family was homeless and destitute? Was this before or after he was shot in both legs, dying in the hospital? If before, was it the liquor money that paid for the vehicle? If after, did the money come from Wathen or the Ku Klux Klan? There were so many questions. The prophet often said that it was a 1926 Model T, and by his timeline he claimed that it was a brand new car. This would place his trip out west at age 18, according to the timeline I'd found of historical record. Curious, I dug up all the photographs that I could find of the Prophet's early vehicles. I never really noticed it in the old photos of the Prophet's automobiles, but the automobiles were different. All of the old 1920s automobiles looked the same to me, but after examining them more closely, each of the radiators were different. One radiator was thin and round at the bottom. One was wider and less round at the bottom. One was straight at the top with an eagle ornament. One car was a two-seater with a convertible top. Another was a sedan. Quickly, I started searching for everything that the prophet said about his automobiles. He always mentioned multiple new automobiles, both Ford and Chevy. I always thought he just didn't remember which brand of automobile that he bought. I suddenly began to realize that his memory wasn't the problem. My understanding of the prophet's early life was missing key facts. The facts that I had were not making sense at all. The prophet said that age 16 he lived at 16th and Henshaw in Phoenix. Age 16 simply did not fit. Before the rifle accident he was, by all accounts, too poor to purchase any vehicle if those accounts from the newspapers were to be believed. The prophet seemed to verify them when he described his hospitalization. He said that the family had no food, which matched the newspaper accounts. After the accident, based on the description of his injuries, it would have been several months before he was able to drive. If he did, in fact, purchase the 1926 vehicle and then travel out west, age 18 would make much more sense. In either case, the facts uncovered raised more questions than they answered. Where did he come up with the money for the new vehicle? And why did he travel out west? With each of the parties influencing the Branham family, every scenario was just as curious. Did Wathen give the prophet a large sum of money for fueling the whiskey still? Or as a favor to Charles for running the still? Did some rich donor offer a large charitable contribution for the Branham family, large enough to purchase vehicles for the children? Did the Ku Klux Klan give the prophet money for the vehicle? And if so, why? As unlikely as it might seem, his favorable statements for the Ku Klux Klan, combined with his unfavorable statements about his father and the whiskey still, presented the most likely scenario it would appear that the prophet had taken the anti-liquor side of the Ku Klux Klan against his father. I knew that I would never find out why the Ku Klux Klan paid his hospital bills or how he produced the money for the new vehicle. So I decided to dig deeper into his time in Arizona. I signed up for a newspapers.com subscription which enabled me to search for articles and read newspapers in multiple cities across the United States. I was pleased with the interface, 
No longer was I sifting through thousands of microfish slides to find an article. I could easily search using keywords, phrases, dates, and locations. At the same time, Jeffersonville, Indiana had not yet been indexed by the archives, or I would have been curious to re-examine the first 18 years of the prophet's life to a more and full complete set of research data. I pulled up the historical archives of the newspapers in Phoenix, Arizona to see what I could find. I found an article in the Arizona Republican from 1928 that raised my interest. It described the school systems in Phoenix and Tempe. The phrase 16th and Henshaw was found in an article about the Wilson School District. It described the schedule of classes and activities for the school district. The schedule for 16th and Henshaw was 7.50 a.m. Henshaw Road was part of a civil works project in 1933, which meant that the photographs from the early 1930s were available. Looking towards the east, it would have seemed much like I imagined the prophet's lifestyle, barren. Looking away from the city towards the undeveloped land, it would have looked much like a barren wilderness. But to the west, to the city, there was quickly expanding civilization. Phoenix was quite a large city with towering buildings, paved roads, automobiles moving down the streets, bicycles on the sidewalks, and busy intersections. Businessmen dressed in fancy suits scurried into their daily white-collar jobs in modern office complexes. Henshaw Road was later named Buckeye Road. Henshaw ran into the heart of the city and it crossed 16th Street just a couple miles from downtown. From where the prophet lived, the view from his windows would not have been open desert in the wild, wild west. He would have seen the Phoenix skyline. He would have seen the large eight-story Hotel San Carlos being erected and watched it open in 1928. He would have seen the massive Westward Ho Hotel, a 16-story, 320-room hotel that towered over the city. It also opened in 1928. When I listen to the prophet's stories about his time out west, living on the corner of 16th and Henshaw, I never pictured a concrete jungle filled with skyscrapers. Phoenix of the 1920s was a busy city. A busy city that was just within walking distance for the prophet. As I looked over the historic photos of Phoenix from the archives online, I started thinking about the early photos of the prophet from a much different point of view. Instead of picturing him rustling cattle on a dude ranch or working as a cowhand on a ranch, I looked at them from the perspective of a city slicker going in and out of the local businesses and restaurants near his house. When I did, the old photographs of the prophet seemed to come alive. In the photos we have from that era, he was well dressed as though he were wearing a college uniform. The pictures seemed to be in a school setting. All of the photos were professionally done, which made me think about the photographs themselves. Even the camera that took them seemed out of place in the stories of the time out west. Your average ranch hand was not carrying a camera. Some of the photographs would have made perfect yearbook photos. In the set, each photo looked to be very close in age, almost a year apart. As he aged, his facial features became more distinct. By the fourth photograph in the set, the prophet was a fully grown man. He said that he quit school after seventh grade because his father died. But I'd learned that this wasn't exactly true. I began to wonder, did the prophet attend college in Arizona? Looking through the photos of Phoenix in the 1920s, I also realized that this was a step up in life from what it would have been in the gambling town of Jeffersonville, Indiana. The prophet's opportunities would have been limitless. Still, I was curious, what made him decide to leave? If he did attend college in Phoenix, what made him return to Jeffersonville, Indiana of all places? I remembered an article that I came across in the Louisville newspaper when I was researching downtown Jeffersonville. William Branham's brother, Edward, had shot and killed a man. Edward was trading a firearm for an automobile and he killed John Burse. Witnesses said that the gun was in Branham's hand when it was fired at the home of his father, Charles Branham. 
On January 5, 1928, he was charged with murder in the first degree. Only a few months later, Edward died. The cause of his death was listed as rheumatic heart disease. In the 1929 obituary, William Branham was listed as living in Kansas. The more information that I found, the more the facts grew stranger and stranger. Kansas was a piece of the puzzle that just didn't fit. Why Kansas? Did the Kansas outlaw have more meaning than the story intended? If he attended school in Phoenix, he didn't immediately return to Jeffersonville. Did Edward's death cause the prophet to return? There was still an unexplained gap in the timeline. The prophet mysteriously fell into a large sum of money, left town, stayed in Phoenix for a few years, landed in Kansas, and then re-emerged in Jeffersonville, Indiana as a preacher. The prophet said that he started preaching in 1930, and that was one of his memories that remained consistent all through his life stories. He often told about how the Reverend Roy E. Davis ordained him as a minister. At that time, I knew very little about Roy Davis. I only knew him as Dr. Roy E. Davis, the Baptist minister, and that he had a church in Jeffersonville, Indiana. I returned to the local Jeffersonville Public Library and began digging through old newspapers to see what I could find about Reverend Roy Davis. I was very surprised that his church first started in Louisville, Kentucky, and that he later moved to Jeffersonville, Indiana. A couple of other researchers had found some newspaper articles of the church that Davis started in Jeffersonville. I was surprised to learn that Roy Davis's Jeffersonville church was Pentecostal and named the Pentecostal Baptist Church, preaching a Pentecostal holiness doctrine. The prophet had called it a Baptist church and made it sound as though he had never been around Pentecostal people. Adding to my surprise was an article written by Reverend Roy E. Davis and published in an October 1950 issue of The Voice of Healing, confirming the Pentecostal affiliation of the church. According to Davis, he had introduced the prophet to the very first Pentecostal assembly that he had ever frequented. Another researcher found an even more disturbing document produced by the United States government. A man by the name of Roy E. Davis was mentioned in a testimony before the United States Congress during an investigation into the Ku Klux Klan after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Was this the same Roy E. Davis? It was time to start digging into the Pentecostal Baptist Church and the Prophet's conversion to Pentecostalism. <laughs>